Uh, we are going to get started. I am uh, delighted to be here today. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I am a professor at Rutgers University in the Graduate School of Education. Um, I have the honor of holding the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Endowed Chair in Education. And one of the things that I get to do every year is invite really interesting people to uh, be the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Distinguished Lecturer. And I'm very excited about um, the um, individual joining us today. So um, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, the name of the the uh, uh, talk is Black Colleges and the Future of American Democracy, Two Legacies and an Imperative. And uh, we are very excited to have John Wilson Jr. with us today. I'm gonna do, do a brief introduction of him and then I'm gonna hand it over to John to um, take a walk through his latest book with you. And then we'll have lots of time for questions. Uh, so. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, first of all, I consider uh, John a uh, a friend and um, have really learned a lot from him over the years. I'll give you uh, a little bit of his history for those of you who might not know him. So in October 2021, John became the executive director of the Millennium Leadership Initiative, which is a, an established leadership development program under the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And he has lots of expertise to be able to be in that position. Uh, from August 2017 to October 2021, he served at Harvard Univers as Harvard University's for, uh, first, first as a president in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and then as the senior advisor and strategist to the Harvard president, where he guided the university's launch of a new effort at equity, inclusion, and belonging. And then his final year was spent as a visiting scholar at Harvard Business School, where he completed this new book on the future of higher education with an emphasis on HBCUs. And that book is called Hope and Healing, Black Colleges and the Future of American Democracy, published by Harvard Education Press. And we're really excited because we're going to be um, putting in the chat a, um, a code so that you can get a discount if you want to order the book. I also wanted to note that in the nine years prior to doing the work at Harvard, um, he John served in uh, the first term under President Barack Obama as the executive director of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities, which is where I got to know him and, and really uh, understand sort of his vision for HBCUs and higher education. And then he also served uh, with distinction as the 11th president of Morehouse College, which is his alma mater. So uh, John, I am very excited to have you here with us today. I am thrilled about the, the opportunity to be able to learn from you today. And I'm hoping that our wonderful audience will have lots and lots of questions and put them in the Q&A so that we can have a really robust discussion after you, um, you uh, tell us about this work you've been doing. So take it away, my friend. Thank you, um, Mary Beth, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Gassman. Uh, I thank you. Uh, I'm honored to say you've learned a lot from me. I think I've learned more from you because I've read uh, uh, everything you've written. Um, uh, we did meet at the White House, and I was fortunate because uh, I hired one of your students um, to, uh, to help me, um, Dr. Tafoya Ransom. Uh, a very sharp student, and I took her with me to Morehouse, um, and um, she was amazing there, and uh, she's now at the Gates Foundation. So she uh, she is consequential, and I know you've graduated a number of consequential people. So I thank you for this invitation. I should say that I, um, I'm the son and grandson and great-grandson of preachers, and that puts me in the orbit of uh, a lot of the um, most distinguished uh, uh, theologians in the country, and Samuel DeWitt Proctor is uh, uh, at uh, the top of that list. He was an amazing man, and I am especially honored to be invited to be uh, the speaker for this lecture, uh, distinguished uh, lecture series. I also want to thank, in addition to Dr. Gassman, I want to thank uh, Giselle and Natalie on her team two very um, 
very professional um, people and who have guided uh, uh, and ushered my uh, my presence here today. So thank you um, both. Thank you to uh, Rutgers and the team there. Um, I know that it's it's 108 now, and, I, and I'm going to stick within the hour that I have and just give you a sense. And I want to start by saying that uh, two emergencies uh, prompted me to uh, to write this book. I think this book has been in me for a long time, but two emergencies um, really motivated me to get it done. Uh, and one emergency is our imperiled democracy. And the other emergency is our imperiled planet. So I believe the democracy is in deep trouble and the planet is in deep trouble. And that's what motivated me to get this book uh, done. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a, a, a sense uh, of the book with some emphasis on two things. As, as Mary Beth said, the theme is two legacies and an imperative. Uh, but before I do that, I want you to know there are three um, three pillars that kind of serve as a scaffolding for this. Um, the first pillar is a theology. The second is a strategy. And the third is a philosophy. Um, this is basically the platform on which I stand to write this book. Um, um, the theology, I'm going to borrow from a friend of mine. I, I uh, I attended Morehouse, um, but I went to Harvard Divinity School when I finished Morehouse, and I, I went there with one question in mind. Um, what do all religions have in common? What do all religions have in common? And I discovered what that was while I was at the Harvard Divinity School. But instead of talking about that, I want to show it to you because um, my good friend and classmate from Morehouse uh, uh succinctly summarize what all religions have in common uh with his third film i'm talking about spike lee uh and his 1986 film uh do the right thing and uh in it he has a scene which i refer to as the story of life and another morehouse contemporary bill nunn is uh the uh, featured person in this scene. And uh, what he says is what all religions have in common. And here it is. Take a listen. Lewis latest. Let me tell you the story of right hand, left hand. It's a tale of good and evil. Hey, it was with this hand that Cain iced his brother. Love. These five fingers. They go straight to the soul of man, the right hand, the hand of love. The story of life is this. Static. One hand is always fighting the other hand. And the left hand is kicking much ass. I mean, it looks like the right hand love is finished. But hold on, stop the presses, the right hand's coming back. Yeah, he got the left hand on the ropes now. That's right. Yeah. Ooh, it's a devastating right and hate is hurt. He's down. Ooh, ooh, left hand hate KO'd by love. All right. Left hand hate is KO'd by love. Uh, very succinctly in that 60 second uh, scene. Uh, that's what all religions have in common. Uh, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Islam, all even the smaller religions believe that in the end, good will win out over bad, love will win out over hate, right will win out over wrong. Um, but they do not believe that that's just going to happen. It requires some human agency. And so, but that is the theology that undergirds this. And my book is pursuant to that. I believe that a lot of what I write about ultimately is about uh, a better world and the better world that is consistent with what all religions have in common. So that's the theology. The strategy, again, comes from my biography. I, I attended Morehouse College after uh, growing up in Philadelphia uh, and being educated uh, mostly since third grade in the predominantly white suburbs. 
and uh, frankly, um, uh, it was tough. Uh, we had to uh, do well in school uh, for kids uh, because my mom uh, was a teacher, my dad a preacher, and um, there was trouble if we got uh, Bs and Cs. We were in a competitive mode with the the whites at the school uh, quietly, privately, and uh, we had to do well. And so attending Morehouse after that was was a miracle for me. Uh, I refer to it as the most psychologically wholesome four-year period of my life. I went from being object to subject. They knew my name. Uh, the place was made for me. Um, fast forward, I finished Morehouse and go to Harvard uh, university and it was very different um it reminded me of what i experienced k-12 i uh, morehouse held a crown over my head but uh harvard wanted to try to hold a, a question mark over my head that caused me to question things but i swatted away the crown was too big at that point i had been insulated by my experience at morehouse but that set up kind of this dichotomy and and here's the here's the strategy that that gave birth to in me um my experience at morehouse uh told me that morehouse had optimized had emphasis they had optimized character and when i get got to harvard and I, and i see this great campus and uh these the sprawling faculty, the, the, the well-paid faculty, um, and these students uh, for whom finances is of zero concern. And here I am, I've, I lost a little more than half the guys who were freshmen with me ended up uh, graduating with me. And at Harvard, uh, not a single person uh, left be, due to lack of money. So they had optimized capital at Harvard. And so I started envisioning at that point, I said, you know, Harvard needs exactly what Morehouse has and Morehouse needs exactly what Harvard has. So why not have those both in the same place at the same time? Um, folks, that has never happened. There's no American college in my estimation, no American college or university has ever been fully optimized that is to say, they've gotten character right and capital right at the same time. Um, and that is the strategy. That's the unfinished business that I've emphasized, that I emphasize in the book and that I've been keyed in on in my career. And then uh, the philosophy, it could come from a lot of people, uh, especially Du Bois uh, and uh, a few others. I, I could name Benjamin Elijah Mays being one of them, uh, Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune being another. But the I, I, I think it's best and most crisply stated uh, by this man, John Dewey, who said democracy has to be born anew every generation and education is its midwife. Uh, very succinctly, um, what we do on campus has to have something and something essential to do with the way we live that uh that education our college campuses are are actually uh there in part to curate democracy to make it come true to make it real and um in my estimation um american higher education has been a miserable failure as a midwife uh with one exception and that's the exception I'm going to talk about today. In this book, I ask a question. I ask a lot of questions, really. But I ask, why didn't the civil rights movement happen 100 years before it did? Uh, at least 100 years, but even more, before it did. Why didn't the students and graduates of Harvard and Yale and them, as we say, et cetera, why didn't they, their students and graduates launch a civil rights movement, for instance, after Reconstruction, as encouraged and trained and motivated by their faculty at Harvard and their leaders at Harvard. Why didn't that happen? Why did it take until the 19th, the middle of the last century 
before a sector of higher education took seriously this mandate, midwife and democracy, and pulled off a civil rights movement that changed the trajectory of American democracy fundamentally. That is, so this is the philosophy. And I believe this philosophy is needed now uh, more than ever. So here's the book in a nutshell, five perspectives. Uh, the, the difficult birth of HBCUs, the main aspiration of HBCUs, the unfinished business, and that's the heart of the book right there, four chapters. Uh, and then the last two chapters are from the perspective of the fluttering veil over HBCUs and the messianic promise of HBCUs. And I want to hang out there for a second on the messianic promise, just to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Um, I give a nod to Mary Beth Gassman because of uh, an exhaustive article she wrote about Jenks and Reisman, uh, the controversy that happened back in the 60s when two Harvard scholars, um, Christopher Jenks and David Reisman, um, referred to black colleges as academic disaster areas. Um, I, I, uh, I referenced that in the book, uh, tell a little bit of that story, not, ex not as exhaustively as Mary Beth, but I, um, I, I found out something else about it um, because I, I talked with some of the people who were at a conference that was organized in the aftermath of that, right on the heels of that controversy. And it was held at at Howard University. Howard University. This was in 1967, and Howard was celebrating its 100th anniversary, as was Morehouse in in, in 67. And um, this controversy was all the rage, and they relied on their most celebrated intellectual at the time to come back and and give what they thought was was going to be a talk, rebuking Jen Jenks and Reisman, but. This man, um, Kenneth Clark, did not do that. He did not rebuke them. As a matter of fact, he shocked the whole audience uh, and and said, Jenks and Reisman were correct. <laughs> I was like, whoa. He, he, he gave a talk and he said, they're correct. Um, and he said, and what do you expect? We, we are, uh, we've been broken by racism, our HBCUs, and he's a Howard graduate. Our HBCUs are not what they could be and not what they should be. But what was amazing to me was not his agreement with Jenks and Reisman. And by the way, what he says in this talk is he says, but let me tell you something. Harvard and Yale and Columbia, where he went for graduate school, are far more broken than black colleges. <laughs> They're far more a disaster than black colleges because they have failed miserably to basically do what um, John Dewey mandated. They have ignored, all right, what's going on in the public square, but not like colleges. And he says at the end of that talk, he says, it may very well become the task of that of the inferior, air quotes, predominantly Negro school to save the soul of society. This was, I talked with someone who was there and he said everybody was so angry with Clark that they didn't hear how he ended that. And how he ended that was the thing. And I say it's the thing now, okay? The time has come for the HBCU value proposition to elevate like it has never elevated before. So with that as backdrop, I'm going to talk about two legacies and an imperative after giving you a perspective on history, I'm going to talk about the endowment legacy, the democracy legacy, and the encore imperative. And I'm going to go until 208, because I started at 108. And what I want you to know is that hope and healing is not as much about HBCUs as it is about what will happen to America and the world if we fail to update and scale a version of what black colleges achieved in the last century. That is to say, this I'm talking about a mandate for all of American higher education. We fail to update and scale what black colleges did in the last century. It's going to be big trouble for 
uh, for the country and for uh, the world. So again, it is about largely about HBCUs, but it's about more than that. And I kind of open uh, the perspective in the last couple of chapters. So let's first talk about uh, a perspective on history. And I, I, I want you to know to the degree that I'm uh, that uh, many of the listeners are uh, college students or even graduate students, you have uh, something that I didn't have. Uh, the books that have been written in the, in the last decade and a half or decade or two were not around. And the, the thinking in these books was not around when I was um, at Morehouse and at Harvard. And yet uh, from many scholars at on um, these places, um, the history is being written differently. And I want to put emphasis on the last two you see there, Kendi and Craig Stephen Wilder. Um, those two books are especially good, but they're on a foundation um, set by some of the others too. Um, and um, But the one that I, I want to highlight in this talk is, and I do in my book, is one by Ed Baptist at, um, at Cornell, uh, done in 2014. Uh, and what they do is they reposition our understanding of human enslavement in this country. And I had inklings of this from the boys and piecemeal from Chancellor Williams and Ivan Van Sertema and people like that. But more recently, scholars have gotten into it, and Baptist says enslaved African Americans built the modern United States and indeed the entire modern world in ways both obvious and hidden. And I and this book is you know 500 pages. It's 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 pretty masterful, um, as are the others. But I think this one really gets at that theme. He he says why. I know he's been a little controversial in his sweeping statements, but um, if you read that book carefully, you understand why he says what he says. Now, um, I'm going to say a little more about this, because I know he leaned on David Davis at Yale, who also concluded that by 1860, 80% of America's GNP was from the wealth generated by enslaved African Americans. 80%. I didn't understand that when I was coming through. And to give you a sense of what that means, uh, and this is for people who talk about or think about reparations, in Q1 of 2023 dollars, that would amount to $21.3 trillion. That's what we're talking about. That's um, That means that human enslavement in America was ridiculously significant generating 2 billion pounds of cotton annually by 1860, helped to set this country and, in fact, the Western world um, on a new trajectory for wealth. Because the cotton being generated in America at the hands of human enslavement was supplying not only America and positioning it and growing this economy, but was going uh, all over the world and positioned America as a force in the world. Now, part of my mindset comes from the fact that I started my career in fundraising. And what what is what you quickly understand if you are in fundraising is you have to go to where the money is. Well, that's been true ever since American higher education was born. And American higher education was born in the midst of an economy driven by human enslavement. And therefore, uh, the Ivy League, et cetera, uh, the earliest colleges, got their money from the enslavers, the enslavers. And I put this uh, plaque up that's, that was put up at Wadsworth House at Harvard University by uh Drew Faust, President Drew Faust, an architect of a president, not a contractor, but she broke some eggs. She's an architect of a president. 
And um, that plaque features the name of the four enslaved Americans, Titus, Venus, Juba, and Bilha, who worked for the first three or four presidents of Harvard University. Uh, she commemorated them for the first time and, and had John Lewis to come uh, for that moment at Harvard. What this history told me was that the evolution of American higher education, uh, it was a gilded birth and a gilded journey. They were aided by privilege, aided by wealth, aided by infrastructure, and aided by ideal climate conditions. Their birth, birth because of human enslavement was like uh, on bicycles going downhill. By contrast, HBCUs had a difficult birth. After enduring two and a half centuries of uh, enslavement and enforced illiteracy and, and systemic sexual assault, uh, HBCUs had to be born in those conditions and then pull off three miracles, up from illiteracy, up from poverty, and up from marginality. Uh, and all, all, all that time, it was up from uncertainty. This is a story I, I tell in the book. So I, I, I suggest to you, there's a difference between struggling up a mountain, pushing a boulder like Sisyphus, versus gliding down a mountain, not with a headwind, but with a tailwind, riding on a bike. And, and the labor of African Americans made that so. So after midwifing the birth of the higher ed system, of our oppressors, we then had an opportunity to mother our own institutions. I'm just keeping it real in this lecture. This is Samuel DeWitt Proctor Memorial Lecture. And if you know him, he kept it real. So that's what I'm duty bound and inclined to do. So enough from slavery, you had inadequate state funding and infrastructural gaps and wealth gaps and and you have you had then enough for marginality, still gap widening philanthropy, and I would say uh, that is persistent gap widening philanthropy. All right, I fast forward, and I come to this man, Mordecai Johnson, who was the first African American president of Howard University. He's a Morehouse educated man, and he said in 1928, Negroes must do a contradictory thing. They must insist that the doors of Harvard and Yale be kept open to Negroes and at the same time build up Howard and Lincoln as if there were no Harvard and Yale, all right? Those are basically like two distinctive agendas that he called for in 1928. And uh, basically, uh, roughly 98% of African-American students were enrolled in HBCUs at that time. Um, by, uh, uh, by 1954, the Brown decision, uh, more than 90% of African-American students were enrolled in HBCUs. And then you fast forward, uh, last year, only 7% of African-American students were enrolled in HBCUs. And basically what that means, in, in, in my view, is that the uh, inclusion agenda, that is to say, Insist that, insist that the doors of Harvard and Yale be kept open, that inclusion agenda, uh, mission accomplished. But this other agenda, building up Howard and Lincoln, writ large all Black colleges, as if there were no Harvard and Yale, um, that agenda is where the unfinished business uh, lies. And that's what I'm going to kind of emphasize. That's what I emphasize at the heart of the book. I'll talk about the HBCU mission value proposition, trusteeship, and fundraising. Um, but for our purposes uh, today, for this lecture, I'm going to talk about the endowment legacy, and I talk about that in chapters three and eight, mainly, um, and elsewhere. Uh, and I talk about the democracy legacy. That's more in chapter six, the home of it. And then I talk about the encore imperative um, in, in chapter 10. So that's where we're going to hang out over the next half hour or a little more. Uh, the HBCU endowment legacy. Um, let me start this by saying that a lot of people believe that HBCUs have never been good at raising money. 
And I believed that for a long time, especially when I left Harvard and when I left Morehouse and went to Harvard, I said, oh, wow. Now, this is what I call infrastructure. Um, this is what I call endowment, et cetera. This is what I call uh, wealth getting beyond precarity. Now, we didn't have that at Morehouse, uh, but we had some very good things at Morehouse. I'm going to talk about them as well. So a lot of people may have this belief that HBCUs have never been good at raising money, but that's not true. It's not true. Um, let's go back to 1946. Um, Benjamin Elijah Mays, um, he lamented all the private Negro institutions put together would have less than one third of the endowment of Harvard University. He said that in 1946. Um, folks, I, I, I want to call those the good old days. Uh, just FYI, in 1946, Harvard had an endowment of $138 million. And that would mean HBCUs uh, collectively, private HBCUs, and I didn't get a chance to verify this, had roughly um, 45 million or so. Um, and uh, he lamented that all private colleges combined would be uh, less than a third of Harvard. Those were the good old days. Uh, if you fast forward to 2021, 75 years later, um, all HBCUs had $5.2 billion and Harvard had $53.2 billion. And I'm talking all HBCUs, not all private HBCUs, all HBCUs, all right? So we've gone from HBCUs went from a third in 1946 to less than 10% by 2021. We had a third, it would be 18 billion. It's only $5.2 billion. Um, this was astounding to me. I've been tracking endowments since I started my career. Actually, I noticed what Harvard's was. I lamented as a student uh, what Morehouse's was, and I was writing about it in the student newspaper. I noticed what Harvard was, and that's what I, when I saw that contrast, and then I had the good fortune of starting my career at the birth of the billion dollar capital campaign at MIT, that capital campaign era at MIT, and I was in the midst of that. Um, this may underscore the notion that HBCUs have never been good at raising money, but that's not true. And now I'm going to do something that I never thought I would do. I'm gonna talk about a man who I was taught to uh, despise. And maybe you were taught the same thing because this, is, this was standard curriculum in America. And, and in HBCUs too, I was taught to love deeply W.E.B. Du Bois and to despise this man, Booker T. Washington. And I did so because what I learned about him, but I got converted because I shifted from what the scholars were saying about him, including the villainization um, by Du Bois, but uh, also by his biographers, um, Washington's biographers. And I started reading Booker T. Washington directly, original stuff. And my eyes were open as, as James Baldwin said, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. Okay. <laughs> That's a Sam Proctor kind of thing. Um, I want you to understand this was an extraordinary, uh, man. Um, he was an extraordinary man, especially in terms, not judged as a as an African-American leader, but judged as an educator and the head of an institution. Not just head, but founder, creator of an institution and nurturer of an institution. He started, went down Tuskegee, which is in the middle of all this lynching, and he started in 1881 with no land. And by 1915, when he died in office as principal of Tuskegee, he had 5,000 owned acres, acres owned by Tuskegee. He went from no buildings, the 111 firm brick buildings. He went from no students to 1,537 students 
in thir from 32 states and 19 foreign countries. This was the biggest educational institution, black or white, in the South. He went from zero faculty to 200 full-time faculty showing up at his funeral. And here's the kicker. Uh, here's where I hang out. He went from zero endowment to $2 million in endowment um, by the time he dies in office in 1915. And here's the thing. He had a vision of endowment from the day he started. When he founded Tuskegee, he said, we are going to build a reserve for this institution. He ended up putting it in the charter. He learned about it from his friend and mentor at, uh, at Hampton, General Armstrong. Um, so he knew what to look for. And like Armstrong, he went raising money in the Northeast uh, of the country. But I, I, I needed to take the time to tell you how significant it is to have $2 million in endowment in 1915. So what I did was I, I took a look at the rest of higher education. And here's what I discovered. And all of this is in, in the book. It took 34 years to build an endowment. And this man was born into human enslavement. All right. He was born into slavery. So he took 34 years to build a, an endowment of, of $2 million. I took a look at how long it took some of the other prestigious institutions in this country whose names we would know to generate an endowment of $2 million. Smith College took 48 years. They got it in 1919. Amherst took 88 years. They got it in 1909. Williams, 167 years to get $2 million in endowment, which they arrived at in 1960, all right? Um, then you take a look at a lot of others, Amherst, Bates, Bowden, Colby, Furman, Davidson, you see them all there. On average, they took 86 years to have an endowment of $2 million. Um, and by the way, Harvard took 233 years to have an endowment of $2 million. But not Booker T. Washington. He got it in 34 years. And, and guess what, folks? If you look at this, you know, I told you that in 2021, all HBCUs combined um, had less than 10% of Harvard's endowment. Go back to 1915 and look at Tuskegee at $2 million, all right? Harvard had $28 million in 1915. So all HBCUs are at under 10% of Harvard, Harvard's endowment in 2021. Tuskegee has 7% of Harvard's endowment in 1915. And not only that, a few months before he died, Booker T. Washington announced a capital campaign, yes, for $3 million more in endowment in today's dollars, that would be the first billion dollar capital campaign in higher education. 7% of Harvard's endowment in 1915. And Tuskegee is um, was a front runner in all this. Now, I wanna turn to something I know that occurs to a lot of you listeners because it occurred to me. I I said, yeah, he raised that money. But from what I learned about Booker T. Washington, he raised that money because he was, he was accommodating. He was bowing and scraping. He was humiliating himself before these wealthy whites. He's making a fool of himself. So that's how he raised the money. And that's why they preferred to give money to him and not to boys and some of these other people. Wrong. Wrong, not true. Um, as I said, from the time he started Tuskegee, he wanted to build an endowment. And moreover, he wanted everyone, all the graduates of Tuskegee and all African-Americans in general to get into savings, to build up savings and to be entrepreneurs. He started that at Tuskegee. Um, 
you go back to that very controversial uh, 1895 speech uh, at the uh, Cotton Expedition Exposition in uh, in Atlanta, uh, dubbed by Du Bois as the Atlanta Compromise. Look at how he started that speech. He said, one third of the population of the South is of the Negro race. Race We shall constitute either one third or more of the ignorance and crime of the South or one third of its intelligence and progress. Basically, he said, it's your choice. All right. We can be a third of your problem and the reason why you come falling down. And by that, he meant not just the South, but America. Or we can be a third of the success, the reason why this country stands up. Now, I've had the back page of the Chronicle of Higher Ed twice. And uh, the time I got it in 2012, I wrote about a speech he gave in New York. He gave many speeches in New York that um, included John D. Rockefeller, who, was a, who gave to Tuskegee, and Carnegie, uh, Andrew Carnegie, who gave to Tuskegee also and was on Tuskegee's board of trustees. Okay, these two men are to this day the wealthiest Americans ever relative to GDP. The wealthiest American, and they both were funders of Tuskegee. And in 1903, when Washington told a New York crowd, he said, um, only a complete education will secure the nation's enduring progress. Uh, he gave a speech about that. And I, I talk about that 1903 speech in, in the book. But this was his general message. And it's not unlike what he said in Atlanta. He said, either we're going to be a third of your of your problem or we're going to be we're going to be the key to America's elevation. Now, he had an idea of it because he had been enslaved, but he didn't know what we know now about American human enslavement already being the key to America's elevation. But he was saying that the way you treat us, if you fail to educate us, uh, this whole thing will come down. And when he gave that talk, that's when Andrew Carnegie wrote a check to him for, uh, uh, for $600,000. And that would be a $600 million gift in today's GDP relative terms. So that was a seminal, uh, seminal time. Let me finish up this endowment legacy with a couple more perspectives. Number one, when I started my career in 1985, their total giving in the U.S. was $72 billion. Then it grew. By 2000, it was $230 billion. By 2020, it was $471 billion. And it's over uh, half, uh, half of um, $500 billion. <laughs> 500 billion uh, now. And then you take a look at what HBCU's done. And this is the giving subset of that last slide. This is the giving to higher ed only. And in, in 1985, $6 billion was given uh, to all of higher ed. HBCU's attracted 1.3% of that. Um, by uh, 2015, with four, 41 billion available, we were attracting 288 million, all HBCU's. 0.7%. And by 2020, with $50 billion um, uh, available, uh, roughly 50 then, it's over 50 now, HBCUs uh, attracted uh, $467 million. And that's that's largely because there's a piece of the uh, um, Mackenzie Scott money in that. Um, all right, so you see how we are relative. And by the way, just to tie a bow on this, by 2015, all those colleges that Tuskegee got to $2 million to an endowment faster, uh, and Harvard University. You take a look at Harvard University in 2015, they had an endowment of $37.6 billion. Those institutions that Tuskegee beat now average by 2015, $1.3 billion. That's the average among them. And, and the wealthiest among them at the time was the last to get $2 million, $2 million in endowment. That was Williams. Uh, they were at $2 billion, okay? And Tuskegee in 1915 had $120 million.
HBCUs in the person of Booker T. Washington launched this endowment craze that we see, made it a thing. And I tell a lot of that story in the book. Now I want to pivot to the democracy legacy. And I'm going to do this in 10 minutes. It's going to take, though, a little longer because I'm going to get personal uh, with this. Um, uh, this is about value proposition. And when Kenneth Clark said that HBCUs are going to end up saving the soul of this country, and I say the world, um, this is in the arena of what he meant. Because I've gone there in my thinking, too. I want to talk about a concept of mastery. And in order to do that, I need to talk about my family. Because my family was an example of this. I had a very famous grandfather. My grandfather, Andrew W. Nix, was the first minister to be recorded um, um, by Vocalion Records in 19... 27. And he was by then very popular. He was doing, he was equivalent of viral then. He was doing um, revivals all over the country. Here he was in 1929 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We we had this, my grandma kept this poster. Um, he did a, He did a revival called The Impeachment of Sin. Come every night, tell everybody, bring every sinner. <laughs> okay. And my family um, was conditioned by him. This picture, the big picture that you see was on my, on the wall. I passed by it every day when I got, got up in the morning and went downstairs. And every day when I was coming to bed, there's my grandfather looking at me. If you look at that every day, you better do something consequential with your life because he's looking at you. All right. There's his family. My mother is seated in the middle. Janester and these this family was raised on the concept of mastery. All right, they all went to college, and my grandfather went to college. Um, he was fluent in Hebrew. He was a uh, consequential in Philadelphia. He was recorded, and um, just last year, a PhD student in Florida published uh, his biography. The sermons of Andrew W. Nix, tell his story, tell my family's story. But what my family told me about growing up is what how what they experienced and how they came upon this concept of mastery. And the, the people they talked about the most, um, they talked about two things the most on this concept of mastery. Um, the first one they talked about were these guys. They were based in Philadelphia. Um, Fayard and Harold Nicholas. And they were amazed by them. My mom told stories about them. My uncle, my uncles told stories about them. My grandmother told stories about them. They were in Philadelphia and they used to perform in Philadelphia. Everybody used to go to see them. My family was right there. And the thing about them was they were transformative and they were inspiring. They inspired people to do their very best. And to give you a sense of what they experienced, I'm going to show you something from them. Um, this is from the 1943 film, Stormy Weather, had an all-black cast. It starred Lena Horne, Bill Bojangles Robinson, Cap Calloway, and others. And these two make an appearance. And when I tell you they make an appearance, they made an appearance. This is a two-minute scene. And when my folks and other folks saw this in the theater, they screamed at the a person in the projection room, to run it back because they wanted to see this again. They were amazed by it. And I asked my uncle, they could only describe this to me. I didn't see this scene until later life. I asked him, what fascinated you so much about the Nicholas Brothers? And he said, two things. They were airborne and they had no hands. And I want you to watch this scene.
Okay, those were the Nicholas brothers. You saw the airborne, but I I kind of missed the the no hands portion. Um and 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 believe me, they did this in one shot because you didn't get retakes back then. But the no hands portion, you may have missed it. Here's his his five seconds. Here it is. And go down and get up with no hands. And so this was amazing to my family, and I hope it's amazing to you, but it implanted the idea that, you know what, we have to be better. Whatever we do, we have to master what we do. And the other arena where that was especially important was the big other phenomenon that was going on across the country, but especially in Philly, because there was a Negro League baseball team and they played like five, six blocks from where my folks lived. And so my grandfather was a preacher. And on the Sundays, when there was a Negro League game, uh, he preached the shortest sermons he ever preached because he was at the games too. And when I say he shortened his sermon, it was down to two hours at that point. One of the reasons why I say the fate of many HBCUs in the first half of this century could soon resemble that of Negro League baseball teams in the second half of the century is because of this, of what happened to the Negro League, um, to Negro League baseball. My, young, my youngest uncle, the shortest one who was seated there, tried out for Negro League baseball, but he was not, uh, he was not good enough. So he had to go be excellent in something else. And I want you to understand something about Negro League Baseball. You know how the NBA is more than 75% African-American now? And uh, the NFL is more than 65% African-American now. That was supposed to happen first in baseball. But racism got in the way. And I mean in a huge way. In writing this book, I read a lot of books about Negro League Baseball. And I got into the stories. Some of the histories take it back to 1920, but others go back to 1884 and 1869. I've, I've read like 15 books. This is a sample of them. And what you have to understand is there was a different game being played in Negro League Baseball. All right? Not like Major League Baseball. It was very, very different. And one of my uncle's heroes, um, uh, Buck Leonard, spoke about this in a documentary. Take a listen. The world figured that the best baseball players in the world was in the major leagues. To tell you the truth, you know, we won the majority of those ball games. Not because we were better than the major leagues, because he got all stars on that ball club. These guys could play. But we wanted to prove to the world that they weren't superior because they were white, and we weren't inferior because we were black. The fact that black ball players could go toe to toe with their white contemporaries did not sit well with the major league commissioner, who was a staunch enforcer of segregated baseball. It kind of got embarrassing when Tennis on Mountain Landis became commissioner. He said, this can't go on. The major leagues are supposed to be the major leagues, and they're not supposed to be beaten by somebody else. And especially if you're a white man in, in white America, you don't want to lose it to a black team. <laughs> so. Uh, to preserve that image that the major leagues were some special level above everybody else. He tried to curtail the games. 1929, we played the Detroit Tigers. That's when Joe Atlanta stopped us from playing because we beat them six out of seven straight. And he said, cause too much dissension. Um, I need you to understand something. Uh, major League Baseball just put out these statistics recently that um, they gathered all the stats and they have put them out as official that they had these barnstorming games. Uh, barnstorming games are what they call them, but the Negro League teams would play the Major League teams in like exhibitions. And some of them happened in Philly. My folks went to go see this. And they gathered all the statistics, Major League Baseball, and um, the Negro League teams beat the Major League teams 75% of the time. 75% of the time. So the resistance to integration, merging league, they were nervous. 
because they thought African Americans would do in baseball what they've done in football and in uh, basketball. So there were two theories, two mindsets. One mindset is represented by Mal Good and Jackie Robinson, the other Rube Foster and John Edgar Wyman. Jackie Robinson, of course, was the first to be to integrate. Um, but there are two mindsets, and I call that a fixed mindset because they were okay with the major leagues taking one black player at a time. Rube Foster, who had who was a famous pitcher and then manager of a team and then owned the league, and it was later written about by John Edgar Wyman, they had a different mindset. They understood that it was a very different game being played in the Negro League. And their theory was, we don't want you to take one play at a time. We want you to bring on one team at a time, one in the American League and one in the National League. And then in the ensuing years, you bring another Negro League team in. Well, the people running Major League Baseball didn't want that because they figured out pretty quickly and logically if it's anything like the exhibitions, by the time we get to the World Series, you're going to have a black team there every year. And if you have one team in each league or more than one team in each league, the World Series is going to be black every year. <laughs> Unless something extraordinary happens out of against the odds. And they did not want that. So they said, hell no on teams coming in. We'll take them one at a time, and that's what they did. And the major lesson here, if you take the players, but you do not take the game, you're going to lose something very special. And you're going to lose something irreplaceable. Well, now, pivoting to higher education, and I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. That's what happened in HBCUs. When integration started, they took the players but they did not get the democracy enhancement game. And you know what happened. The league closed in 1960. And at the same time, there's this issue of the integration of higher education. And it started. It started the year after. It started in leapfrogs. The first year, the first big year of admissions in the in the White Hart Ed was 1969, stimulated by King's death. I tell this story, I won't belabor it here. But you see, white higher education had a different game going on. HBCUs, it was very, very different. And I, I, I'm going to talk about Harvard now because Harvard had it was educating people differently. I have three degrees from Harvard. I was senior advisor to two presidents at Harvard, and I was on a board of trustees at Harvard for, Harvard for a six-year term. So I'm not talking about what I don't know, but I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to go to one of Harvard's most famous graduates, and that would be Bill Gates. He came out of Harvard in 1975 and, and returned in, 19, in 2007, and he said this to the graduating class at Harvard. He said, I left Harvard with no real awareness of the awful inequities in the world and the appalling disparities of health and wealth and opportunity that condemn millions of people to lives of despair. He left Harvard with a blindness. By contrast, this man, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who attended Morehouse College, that's his graduation picture, as groomed by Benjamin Elijah Mays, uh, there was something, the education was different at Morehouse and, and most black colleges. In his most, in the most recent, just put out last year, the most recent biography about Jonathan Ike, he says, Mays would send a small army of Black activists into the world, giving his young charges the hope, confidence, and connections to attack injustice at a time when the fear of reprisals deterred many others. He set out to empower his students to produce young men charged with changing the world. To be, more, to be a Morehouse man, he made clear, was to be a special order and to bear a special responsibility. I need you to understand something. This was going on at most HBCUs. And to give you a sense of the graduates, this is a lineup of the graduates. I have, I'm just going to show you flash across some of these uh, graduates from HBCUs. Zora Neale Hurston, Tony Morrison, you see there. 
uh, others uh, from Russ College. We have Ida B. Wells. You have Alice Walker and Marion Wright Edelman from uh, Spelman. This this is an amazing lineup of of people, and they all came out of this democracy centric um, education, and that's why. HBCUs put democracy first. So what is the encore? And I wrap up with this. I insist that American higher education must use an HBCU approach to shaping better citizens. And I tell these stories in the book. I say a broken democracy cannot heal a broken planet. And therefore, we need people with a destination mindset, echoing Du Bois, that is people not just concerned about where they will sit on the train called America or the train called life, but where the train is going, its rate of speed and its destination. To have a sense and a sensibility of the common good, that's what HBCUs did. To have a second day mindset. I told my students at Morehouse when I presided, the two most important days of your life, this is from Mark Twain, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. There are 8 billion people in the world that means 8 billion have had their first day, but only a tiny fraction have had their second day. That means they are living life on purpose. They are doing what they were born to do. Colleges can do that. That's what Morehouse did for Martin Luther King and Spike Lee did for myself and others. You can be a second day institution and shape more people who happen to the day instead of the day happening to them and then, of course, I build the entire book around this concept of the string shooters. I won't tell the story here, but it's about getting the, all of the skills of today's world, but doing something different with them. I open the, 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 the book with this story of the string shooters. It's, it's embedded in the book called The Healers, written by Ike Wei Arma who is at this point the most brilliant man alive. I'm, I've become friends with him. He's still alive. He lives in Senegal. He was uh, touted as the smartest man on the continent. They sent him to Achimoda in Ghana. Then they he was too smart. They sent him to Groton. He blew them away. And then he went to Harvard and finished it in three years. And he started writing novels. This is, I believe, his best, The Healers. And he tells a story about this string shooter, a, a man who decides to elevate the values of his time. And in a competition to shoot a bird out of the sky, he instead shoots the string that frees the bird. Instead of shooting the bird, he deliberately shot the string that freed the bird. Instead of preserving control, he released it. Instead of taking a life, he liberated one. We need to do, college graduates must do the equivalent of that today. We must educate, higher education must educate string shooters. That is our mandate. And if we can do that, we can save the country and save the world. I know it's time for Q&A right now, but I hope you've enjoyed two legacies and an imperative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm ending at 208, Mary Beth. I know. Right great, great <laughs> job. Great job. Thank you so much. I love uh, learning and just hearing uh, your perspective. So we have a lot of questions. I'm going to get right into them. Uh, there are all different kinds of questions. So the first one I'm going to ask uh, is uh, from uh, Marla's Fischler. And she's asking, are the sources of funding for HBCUs different from other universities? I noticed in your slide, most of the funding came from individual contributions. Um, that is the case in higher education in general. Um, most of the funding comes from wealthy individuals and the corporations and foundations come way after that. But, and, and, and obviously a driver of that is alumni giving. So that's why a lot of these well-heeled institutions uh, do so well. But that is the case across the board. Individual Individuals give the most money by far. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another one from Rodney Cohen. Uh, as a graduate of Clark College, I witnessed the merger with Atlanta University. Do you see a future of many more HBCUs moving toward merger, consolidation, or intentional sharing of resources? That's a great question, uh, Ronnie. I, 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 I do think... Um, that's going to have to happen, especially among the privates. Uh, 
a lot of the privates. And it's already happening uh, in higher education in general. I do recommend it. Uh, and mergers have been discussed for the longest time. W.B. Du Bois insisted uh, that Wilberforce and Central State merge. There have been conversations about merging the Atlanta cluster, not just Clark, Clark with AU, but the Atlanta cluster. Uh, North Carolina has 10 HBCUs. So yes, that conversation is still going to con is going to continue. One quick thing, when I was at the White House, I convened a meeting with the six AME uh, affiliated HBCUs. Shorter, Wilberforce, Allen College, Paul Quinn, um, Morris Brown, and Edward Waters. I had the leaders, the bishops associated with them all at the White House. And ultimately, what, since they're all struggling, I, I said, let's talk about a merger. Uh, five, within five minutes after suggesting that, the meeting was over. <laughs> because it's just, but I think it's going to have to be broached sooner or later. Yes, Rami. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another one uh, from Carla Rubinger. Can you address the great increase in giving since George Floyd and now a decline again? Uh, uh, yeah, we were hoping that the giving uh, on the heels of George Floyd, including that um, by Mackenzie Scott and Mary Beth, I give a nod to you. I, I did come across the report you generated on that giving. It was It was quite good. Um, uh, we were hoping that it would be a movement, um, and the start of a new era instead of a moment. Um, uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, that giving was not contagious and is not contagious. And, uh, that to me is a, a, a tragedy. Uh, part of it is our fault. I think HBCU leadership can elevate the value proposition of HBCUs more but I would cite more so than that the um, the bias in the philanthropic community that's been there for a long, long time. I will tell you to prove concept on my theory that there are things we can do differently. I raised seventy million dollars. This is before George Floyd as president of Morehouse, the most ever raised, and the top two years in alumni giving in Morehouse's history are on my watch. Uh, and, and because we put emphasis on it. I will tell you this, I, this is my final wrap on, on, on that question. Um, Harvard uh, and Yale and them, I'll just say, have uh, more than four or 500 people raising money. When I was at the White House, the average HBCU had 10 people raising money, all right, full time. So, um, I think putting more emphasis, I more than doubled the office when I was at Morehouse, putting more emphasis there will bring in greater returns, but we still have to do something about the bias in the philanthropic community. Thank you for that answer too. So um, I've got uh, a bit of a, a, a statement and a, a big question for you. So here goes, right. this is from Vance Stevens, um, who's one of uh, the, our PhD students here at Rutgers. Um, he says, thank you for speaking with us today. This information and framing resonates deeply. I'm thinking of some through lines, specifically the juxtaposition of HBCUs and the quote Harvard, Yale uh, and them institutions and the optimized character, optimi optimized capital framework. And it makes me think about MLK's invoking Morehouse and I think uh, Boston University words about the purpose of education and the critical need for both intelligence plus character. I'm wondering what role HBCUs might play in addressing the rising national discourse about the value of higher education and the framing around the diminishing returns of pursuing higher education. I'm especially interested in this as I feel like these narratives are aimed primarily for black and brown youth, which is made even more complicated when we consider the non-monetary motivations associated with the pursuit of education, historic, historical enforced illiteracy, education, liberation frameworks, et cetera. So any thoughts? <laughs> wow, uh, Vance. Uh, okay, so <laughs> that's a Mary Beth student right there. <laughs> yes, it is actually. <laughs> that's uh no, I know. I can hear it. Uh, that 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 is a textured uh question. And um 
so I, I, I don't think uh, this message is just for, I'm not sure how you meant that, but um, I'm going to go to the bigger point I think you're making, and that is the value of this. I believe the value of higher education is greater now than it's ever been, but not for the, the predictable stuff, not for vocationalism. It's greater now than it's ever been for democracy. I mean, we got half this country thinking that progress is moving backward. And, and, and the other half, not entirely clear that it's moving, it's, it's about moving forward, but there are debates in the other half about how fast. <laughs> we got half the country who's nervous, scared to death, I would say, about the browning of America. When, if you read our founding documents, we're supposed to say, come one, come all. And as soon as we do that, then we're necessarily diverse, but there's resistance to that. So we, we need an education about what democracy is. Civic, as I said, we have never, higher education in this country has never made good on the philosophy or mandate set out by Dewey and others. And that is to midwife, higher education should midwife democracy. Higher education has not been doing that. And my conclusion in this book is that HBCUs are the only sector that has made an aggressive effort to deliberately and aggressively shape the soldiers and gen foot soldiers and generals of a movement to elevate democracy, to mature democracy, to deliver a democracy that's closer to to what was said on paper. As Dr. King said on the night before he was murdered, all we say, America, is be true to what you said on paper. Dr. King, Thurgood Marshall, that whole civil rights leadership understood in a crystal clear way that the Constitution is on our side, that you have to be, this is what fairness, this is what the law dictates. All are created equal. So I believe, uh, Vance, that this is the time to, to advance the idea, Vance, of, <laughs> of HBCUs, of higher education. And as a matter of fact, as we do that, I hope that will drive the price point down. I hope the, the federal government will get itself together and stop throwing billions and billions of dollars at war and, and throw billions and billions of dollars at, at elevating the human capital in this country via support for education, making access to education a lot easier. Great question, Vance. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another one. This one's from Carlos Smith asking, or a uh, statement and a question. As a Hampton alum, I very much appreciate your attention to Booker T. Washington and the nuances and tensions around his narrative. As a health professions educator and dentist with growing awareness around health disparities and inequities, I'd love to hear your insights on more HBCUs starting medical or dental schools. I'd love to see that, but it seems much easier said than done financially. Is that a feasible approach? That you might said be that was Carlos? Little, what was that? Carlos is the question? Carlos Smith, yes. Carlos. Um, uh, that's a great question, too. I, I will answer it succinctly. Um, when I was uh, at Morehouse, that was when, 75 to 79, that was when the Morehouse Medical School was being born. And that was difficult. That was quite a process. Um, I believe Morgan State is considering one uh, and others. Um, I'm all for that. But the only reason to do that is to double down on the HBCU va value proposition. And that is, we do it differently. So if, if you check out Meharry, and I know you're a health professional, you check out what Meharry's doing and what Morehouse Medical is doing, what Drew is doing, uh, and, and um, Howard, um, they are a disproportionately high number of their doctors go into underserved communities. Why? Because doctors coming out from other medical schools don't get that message, don't get that ethic, and they they go 
to the suburbs. They they're not they're not serving the least among us. So the reason why we need more medical schools, um, HBCU-based medical schools, is more because of that value proposition and that ethic and the kinds of doctors they will be than because we quantitatively need more medical schools. I think we need more quality from a quality standpoint as well as quantity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here's another question. This one, I think, is uh, people wanting a little bit more information on this. This one is from Anonymous. So it says, why do you think Booker T. Washington is dismissed so readily and often without evidence? And you, you talk some about this, but any want to comment on that? Oh, wow. Um, well, he was, um, I'm going I'm to give you a a complex, a complex answer, but it's true. <laughs> um, I think it was dismissed by whites um, because he was dangerous um, in his time. He was scaring people to death. And you, you read my book, and, I'll, I, and I elected officials, senators, a governor threatened his life. They could not, they didn't like what he stood for. He was trying to educate people and they were saying, no, no. So he was very dangerous. When he had dinner at the White House, okay, he couldn't go back to his campus for six months after that because of threats against his life. All right, after the Sam Hose lynching, he had to disappear. That's what, this is the lynching that caused the boys to leave Atlanta. He said, I'm out. This is too barbaric, too much barbarism down here. He went over to Europe for three months because he was having a nervous breakdown. So barbarism is why many of the whites of his time resisted him. The white scholars, unfortunately, thought they were doing us a favor, African-Americans a favor, by villainizing Booker T in scholarship because they didn't like his accommodationism. Well, I reframe that in my book and I say, when he was sounding like that, he was managing barbarism. <laughs> he was keeping them from killing him, all right? He had to sound like that sometimes to appease the barbaric lynch artists who would come to hear him. And that, at least for his young life, um, for the time he was in office, he did not die because he got lynched, but that was a very real possibility. And it doesn't matter if we don't believe that, he believed that, and he conducted his life that way, and so did most of the people. They understood that he could die at any minute. So I think the biographers think they're doing us a favor by villainizing the man, when if all you have to do is read him and what he said, and you would not do that. You would pay more attention about the forces causing him to sound like that than the fact that he sounds like that. Booker T, I mean, uh, the boys could be all articulate and throw these word grenades at people and then go and hide out in the North, <laughs> insulated from, from the danger. If you did that in the South, you would not live long, okay? In spite of that, as I say in the book, Booker T. Washington tried to hire W.B. Du Bois four separate times on its mm -hmm. campus because he wanted to come down and help him stand up a great university. I'll, I'll full stop there. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting. You know, whenever I teach history of American higher education, when I often will um, show my students um, primary sources or original documents of Booker T. Washington giving money uh to um anti-lynching campaigns and i'll wow. show like the documents that i found in archives of him act you know uh, basically transfers of money letters yeah. showing this and and they'll say no that can't be true and i'm like yeah. well these are all in there he was he was funneling money into it's interesting that you brought up lynching because he was yeah. funneling money into anti-lynching and a lot of people my students from time to time will say that just can't be true Right, yeah. that because of what people have heard in in very in ways that lack nuance, right? Yeah. That don't show that most people are pretty complicated, 
and yeah. uh, and yeah. you know, and also I'm I'm glad that you also brought up um, the differences of operating in the north and the south, right? There yeah. there were distinct differences. So thank thank you. Let, let me let me just elaborate a little bit more because I I, I need you to know, um, Berkeley Washington became heroic for me because he when he failed to hire Du Bois, he hired Nathan Work, and Nathan Work is 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 the guy Chicago trained the guy who um started a lynching uh a lynching uh database they were mm -hmm. count they were keeping track and Booker D. Washington would go north and talk about how many blacks have been killed they keep all the data there and it became the most reliable source and as a matter of fact it's relied on uh, upon to this day Booker D. Washington was a quiet force for good I tell the story in the book about how he saved one person's life the, the let me tell you how the way the African-Americans in his environment understood him. The whites were after this man for no good reason to lynch him. And what they did, they did something that's counterintuitive based on what we're taught. They brought him to the house of Booker T. Washington and Booker T. Washington hid this man in his basement. And when the whites came knocking, asking if Booker T had any information. Booker T said, I, I know nothing about that. I know. That's not the Booker T Washington we're taught about, nor mm -hmm. are we taught about the Booker T Washington who raised money, helped Mary McLeod Bethune raise money for her institution, raised money for Morehouse College, okay? Raised money and was on the board of Fisk, raised money and was on the board of, of Howard University. And he wrote a letter to Kelly Miller, famous professor at Howard, saying, you know that annual appropriation you get every year from the government? It's important that you not rely on that and build your own endowment. Because sooner or later, if it was in biblical terms, my father and grandfather would say, there will arise a Pharaoh who doesn't know that David called Howard, and, he, and they will cut off that, that appropriation and then where will you be? He encouraged them in writing to build your own endowment. He did that in 1911, I think it was. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is this guy is fundamentally misunderstood, and he is a Hampton man, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had some chills going down my spine there for a minute. So, um, Okay, so here's the last question, John. Um, all right. And it's a big one. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like it's it's 25 years from now. Tell me about HBCUs. What's going oh on? God. What's happening? From all that you know, and being president of an HBCU and working with the White House and doing all of this research and attending an HBCU, 25 years from now, what do you think? Um, I I am quite nervous. I I think the states since we saw the recent announcement about the 12 billion, which I might add is a far cry from 21.3 billion <laughs> trillion, I mean, as mm -hmm. a, in terms of reparations framework, but we saw the recent now. So I think the States might figure out how to not just keep them alive, but begin to position the state affiliated to thrive. But unless there is a radical shift in the philanthropic, and the thinking of a philanthropic community, I'm. Um, it's hard for me to be optimistic. Uh, either a radical shift in the philanthropic community, their thinking, or in the thinking of the federal government and uh, and the history of racism in this country, or I might add, in the thinking of African American philanthropists. Um, mm -hmm. That is an untapped source. I felt I might have answered this question differently when prime time was at Jackson State um, because I thought that might magnetize and I'm not being frivolous when I bring that I know it's football but um, there's a halo effect of these programs if you don't believe that you ask you ask these big football programs they are they have black bodies running around on football fields as if they are in cotton fields generating all kinds of wealth for these white institutions. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm i like, I, I was trying to revive sports at, at Morehouse um, because I, 
this is an echo. This is slavery by another name, as another scholar called it. I, I, I really, uh, so that takes me down a pathway and I can't, I don't have time for that. But uh, to answer your question more directly, Mayor Beth, I'm, uh, I'm nervous about the future prospects for private HBCUs, but I believe uh, my book and most of it is, is, is targeted at the philanthropic community. If they hear that, and if HBCUs hear a shift of emphasis on our value proposition, I think we can uh, create a bright future. I do think it's still within the province of our control to create a brighter future. If we have iceberg trustees and enlightened presidents to build teams to do it. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for this. I loved learning with you and I really appreciate everybody for asking great questions. Yes, and thank I you. I just, uh, you know, I, I so appreciate you doing this great work and it's such a pleasure to have you with us um, for this distinguished lecture. And I um, just a big, big thank you uh, for being with us. I do want to tell everyone that we um, do have a code from Harvard Education Press, which we will put in the chat, uh, which will allow you to get 20% off Hope and Healing. I think you will love this book. I uh, had the honor of reviewing it and I thought it was just wonderful. And, um, you know, uh, bravo, bravo, uh, John. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, everybody take good care.